Hello and welcome to our IG Live. We had a bit of a break, it took a week off last week for a little vacation, but we are back and so excited to be talking to our guest. Liola, and hold on, just getting her on here for you. She is, oh, hello, thank you for joining us. She's a wonderful author that we're gonna talk to. Hello. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Doing well, thank you. So good to talk to you again. For those that don't know, um, we were actually able to chat on Read Your World. Can't remember when the, exactly a few months back, but it was so much fun that I thought I need to do this again. <laughs> so now we're back on Makeaway Media, and so we're going to try and not overlap the content too much. So you can go back and watch both interviews. But um, first of all, thank you for being on here with us. And can you introduce yourself for those that don't know you? Of course. Of course. Well, thank you so much for having me. My name is Brunella, Brunella Costaiola, and I am a ghost writer, an editor, but also a children's book author. Wonderful. And that, I, I love it. That makes you, I guess, what is that, a triple threat <laughs> that you can, the author, the ghost writer, uh, editor. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit more later, but maybe we can start talking about your children's series. Can you tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about that? And also, um, one of the things that I love about it is that it is really advocates for diversity. So can you tell us a little bit about the books? Of course. So I have it right here. It's um, A Stroke of Magic, book one, The Dinosaur Woman. Um, it's a children's book series that follows the story of our three protagonists, um, Italian-American twins, Ella and Alex and their Afro-Panamanian friend, Lila. They, it's set in a retirement home uh, in uh, Vero Beach, Florida. It's a fictionalized retirement home, but it's so much fun to be there. There's just about everything one would possibly need to have oh so much fun. And the children go there because to visit Lila's abuelita, so grandmother, but also because um, Ella and Alex's mama, so mom in Italian, works there as a nurse. And while they're there, they get to know the other residents. One of them is an artist named Art. And Art paints a beautiful painting of dinosaurs, but as the children look closer, to the painting, they notice that there's a woman. So what is a woman doing among the dinosaurs? Um, at that question, the, pain, the, the paintbrush, Emmett, the, med the magical paintbrush, comes to life, and he basically makes the children jump into the painting, travel back in time to discover the truth about Mary Anning, the historical figure featured in book one. Mary Anning was a paleontologist uh, in England during the early 1800s. And even though she discovered many fossils uh, that contributed to the theory of evolution put forth by Charles Darwin, um, unfortunately her discoveries were credited to men because of her gender. And for the entire series, so that was book one, but for the entire series, the three children jump into a painting, travel back in time to find the truth about a historical figure whose name has been lost to history amnesia and therefore has been marginalized. And I know book two is going to be coming out soon and that for that you're, they're going to be going to Hawaii. Yes, we're going to Hawaii uh, to discover the truth about the last Hawaiian princess. I love that and, and I know we had talked some about how you picked the figures from history, but why is it so important? Why do you think that kids need to know about these um, these historical figures who are so important, but as you say, who's you know uh, who have been whose stories have been lost to historical amnesia? Well, I when I was growing up um, studying history from history books, as an adult, I understood I only learned one side of history. I learned the winner side right? History books are written by those who win um, in most, most cases. So as an adult, I came to the realization that I was ignorant when it came to even my own history of Southern Italy. And because I'm, I'm, I was born and raised in Naples in Southern Italy. Um, so 
that brought me to a personal journey of self-discovery through stories that I could not find anywhere in any history book. Because of that, I started understanding how important it is to know and learn about both sides of the same metal. Um, and my, my purpose um, with especially this um, children's book series is to show children a story that perhaps they don't get to learn about in history books while in school. Um, for example, with Mary Anning, I had so many adults who have been always so passionate about uh, dinosaurs, not just as children, but actually as adults, come to me and tell me, I never knew about Mary Anning. Or, um, well, my, my book, yes, my second book will come out, but uh, for now, my editor has read it and she told me that even she was not aware of so many things that I reveal in book two of a stroke of magic uh, series so it's a way for me to bring that addition that history books are clearly lacking and i love how it's also you phrase it that for yourself it was a journey of self-discovery to to learn about these um these figures and especially when it's talking about one's own heritage or about other people's um can you talk about that about why it's important for kids to know their heritage, but especially in a way, or, or their heritage or other people's heritage, but especially in a way that's done really respectfully. Like how, how do you approach it? I know that um, some of it is bringing in your own Italian heritage, but they're also learning about people from other parts of the world. So when you are talking about a different culture, how do you make sure that you're approaching it respectfully? Right, it's extremely important. Um, as an immigrant to the United States of America, I I was um, first and foremost incredibly proud to be now a citizen, but I also noticed just how incredibly stereotypical and frozen back in the 1950s, the representation of Italian Americans is in the majority of of uh, media, American media. Um, you know, there are people who have made comments to me jokingly, um, but you know, some not so jokingly about whether or not I was part of the, the family simply because I came from Southern Italy and, or, or references to the Godfather or whatnot. So to me, as an Italian and now an Italian American, that is the worst, but the, the, the part that made it into the American media is the worst part of where I come from. It's something that none of us are proud of. So I couldn't understand why it was so predominant here. Um, you know, there, there are so many people where I'm from fighting against all of this organized crime and losing their lives as we speak. So to me, it's not something that needs to be magnified or that needs to be sensationalized or even romanticized. But I couldn't find anything else besides the classic and very stereotypical representations of Italian Americans who couldn't speak English very well or who were overweight, um, always cooking, um, ignorant. So I thought, what is going on and how? how can I help? And as a writer, but also as a mother, it comes, it came to a point for me that I decided, okay, I have to do something about this because my children are growing up in a country that depicts their community of Italian Americans rather stereotypically. So what can I, what can I do in my little small world that maybe I can make an impact or I, I can start a conversation? And that is also the reason why I started working as a cultural accuracy reader. So I have many people come to me, many people who've written uh, perhaps a character uh, that has Italian American culture. They come to me and they ask me to read through it, just the character representation or per perhaps as a, a historical uh, event that they just wanna make sure they haven't fallen into the trap of stereotypes mm -hmm. or into the trap of, well, this is how I read it and learned it in history books, which I personally have learned, as I said before, it's not the whole story. And many times 
it is not the story at all. It's been modified to fit the specific political climate. So when I write my children's books, um, as I mentioned before, two out of three of my characters are Italian-American, so I bring my own culture into it, but one of them is Afro-Panamanian. Of course I'm not, nor do I have any sort of uh, respectful and, um, I guess, clear knowledge of what Afro-Panamanian culture is, which is the reason why I hired a cultural accuracy reader. She's Afro-Panamanian. She's co-owner of the Panama Folklore in Seattle. Um, she's helped me with portraying not only Lila, but also her abuelita. We went as deep uh, into details as the colors of abuelita's dress, which color was never supposed to be there, color red, because of what it means in their culture. So for book two, of course, we talk about the Hawaiian, the last Hawaiian princess. While I have a passion for Polynesian culture. I don't pretend to know much about Polynesian culture and especially in my case, Hawaiian culture. So I hired a Hawaiian uh, woman and Hawaiian language speaker um, also because I wanted, I really wanted to bring lots of Hawaiian language in the book given that just 40, 50 years ago, it was almost extinct. So I wanted to make that contribution of keep Hawaiian language alive um, and, and, and through the language also keep the culture alive. I just, I, I just have to highlight some things that you said that are so wonderful. One is that because of your own uh, experiences and, and sensitivity that you were able to have, bring that sensitivity to other cultures and that you're not just um, asking someone to read it, but that you're hiring them because that's you know, something people talk a lot about making sure to compensate people for their expertise. So I love that you've done that and that you've really found these experts. Details like the color of the dress, I would have, it would have never occurred to me not to have a color red uh, in, in the dress. So that's amazing that you were able to get down to that level of detail. Um, and something that, I mean, so we're talking about cultural heritage, but also uh, something that in, in this book and the other books is just the general idea of kids who are different, you know, whether it's because of their culture, their language, uh, how they look. And so, much, so often kids just want to fit in. And then, you know, you have another book that's going to be coming out about a kid who's Italian American and decides he just wants to be American. And then kind of his, his journey to come to appreciate his heritage. Why is it so important to talk to kids about that? And what tips do you have to help them, you know, to kind of be okay with being different? And how do your books really address that? Well, my, you know, coming here as an immigrant, becoming, going from being Southern Italian to being an immigrant was a cultural shock for me. Uh, suddenly I stood out. And not just um, as much as I tried, uh, because I really tried to, to not have an accent. I remember I was studying in Cambridge this many years ago. I was studying in Cambridge to become a teacher of English language as a second language. And my teacher, she was from France. And one day I tried to sound so British. I really did. I tried my best. But one day, I don't know if it was because it was just painful to hear at that point or if because it was ridiculous um, or just out of kind heart, she came to me and said, stop trying to cover up your accent. Don't you get it? That's your beauty. That's your power. Be proud of it. Embrace your accent. No one had ever told me that. Nobody. I always i'd have always heard no it's not you don't pronounce it this way it's pronounced this way so when she told me embrace your accent because it's your power it's the beauty of who you are my world and the, the way i see the world changed when i came to the states i knew that that being italian uh was going to be something that always stood out and at the beginning it was difficult because of people pointing it out so often that to me it became something 
almost to be secretive about um, until I became a mother and things changed. It's, it's so incredible when you become a parent and you are responsible for, uh, to, to show your children the world in a, in a way that you want them to be proud of. So I started thinking, if I'm not proud of my accent, if I'm not proud of where I'm from because it makes me feel like I stand out or it makes me feel different, how am I ever going to make sure my children feel like they, they fit in, they're part of the community? And that's how my vision and, and, and my view of the world started changing. And also self-acceptance began. Um, so I want my stories to have, among other messages, one specific message. Whatever makes you different, whatever makes you stand out, that is your superpower. That is something that can never be replicated because it belongs to you only and that is what makes you unique. And in this world where everything is so cookie cutter, in this society that wants standardized beauty or standardized uh, criteria, it's the most, the, it, the bravest thing to do is to be yourself and stand out. And that's what I want my uh, protagonist to do. For example, we have Alex, one of the uh, Italian-American twins, who in book two is going to have major difficulties remembering which one is right and which one is left. And I have an 11-year-old who sometimes still has difficulties remembering right and left. He knows which one it is, but his brain gets confused at times. And I used to see him being so mortified about it. But then we found quite a few ways to help him. So now he feels empowered by the knowledge. And that is also something that I wanted to share with my readers. Um, just because you feel like you're standing out, it doesn't make you some be, some, somebody or something to be afraid of. No, embrace it. I love that. What a powerful message to give to kids. And uh, I love that you're incorporating all the, these kind of different aspects of diversity that maybe we don't think about as much, like getting confused about the right and left, or, you know, that you're finding a way to incorporate those into the books, because I'm sure there are lots of other kids that either have that same challenge or something similar, and they think they're the only one, and then they read it in the book, and they say, oh, it's not just me, you know, or, or that it, it is something that, that you can embrace and, and learn how to work with. Um, do you want to talk some about the the novel about the Italian American boy? Of course, of course, yeah. So this novel, it's uh, while A Stroke of Magic is a book series and it's rather uh, short, so it's for I would say lower middle grade readers. Um, my novel, tentative title of the recipe book, um, is for upper middle grade readers so it's a bit more complex um, and the gist of it is there's this Italian American boy whose name is Alessandro Castagna but he uh, he doesn't fit in he feels like he doesn't fit in because of his name it's hard to pronounce many people simply uh, tell him, oh, you say it so well, I don't want to repeat it because I don't want to mess it up. Or many people say, what? How do you say that? Just, you know, to not be acknowledged by your actual first and last name, it's something that immediately makes you feel, oh my gosh, there's something wrong with me, especially at, at the age of 11 or 12 years old you simply want to be part of a community. So when your name is not even acknowledged or is made feel to be this incredibly weird word to pronounce, um, and you, 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 your first instinct is to change it so it fits somebody else's mouth. And he changes his name. He goes from Alessandro, which is Alexander in Italian, to Alexander. But once you change your name, you 
start changing your identity. He doesn't fit in also because he brings panini to school or pasta al forno to school instead of, I don't know, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And because of that, one day he just can't take it anymore. So he makes a mess in school. He gets in trouble with the principal. He goes back home and he, after a confrontation, and it, well, it started as a conversation and ended as a confrontation, he tells his mom, I just don't want to be Italian anymore. What happens, however, is the consequences are not just his mother being heartbroken. The consequences are extreme. And everything that was Italian in Alessandro's life is no longer present. So, for example, um, he listened to Maneskin, the Italian, Ameri the Italian rock band. Um, well, it's not there anymore. Or his posters of um, Italian athletes are no longer in his room. Um, but most of all, he can no longer understand nor speak Italian, which is something that he could do before. And what, what truly breaks his heart is that photos that used to portray Alessandro with his nanna, so his grandmother, his Italian grandmother, now only portray him. And the, the grandmother has disappeared. Um, everything that was Italian in those photos have dis has disappeared as well. So he's lost. Um, but here comes a cousin who gifts him a recipe book, as an empty recipe book, as well as a cucchiarella. Cucchiarella is an Italian, well, Neapolitan word to, to say wooden spoon. Um, and to, to cut a long story short, he jumps into the recipe book thanks to the wooden spoon uh, that functions as a wand, a magical wand. And he travels back in time, um, back to Italy, before it was Italy. Um, and in fact, he starts from when Italy, well, Kuma, southern Italy, was um, the first Greek colony in, uh, in, in Italy. He starts from there and finds learns about what it means to be Italian through food. So he's eating his way through history and learning about himself, his past, his heritage, his ancestors through food. I love it. I was, food is, I think, one of the best ways to learn, to connect with the culture. Mm -hmm. But why, why did, how did you come up on this? I mean, because it's such a great story. How did you come up with food as the way into having him reconnect with culture and heritage? Because as a Southern Italian, um, we have so many dishes that we prepare on special occasions. There is a story for every dish. Mm. There is a story for every ingredient we use, as a matter of fact. So for example, um, we use so much tomatoes now in so many tomatoes and so much tomato in every Italian dish almost, especially Southern Italian dishes. Uh, but perhaps not many people know that it's a relative, relatively new ingredient. It was brought from Peru after the Americas were discovered. Um, but at first, the tomato, especially in Southern Italy, was not used for cooking at all because it didn't taste well. So they used it as just a decoration, a plant, until somebody thought of, started, um, you know, uh, I guess, putting it in the soil. And the volcanic soil that we have in Naples because of the Vesuvio, the, the volcano we have there, the volcanic soil gave the tomato something special, a flavor that wasn't there before. So it was Naples that changed the flavor of the tomato that had been brought from Peru um, and eventually made it into what will become pizza uh, a few, well, quite a few years later. Um, and then it became such a staple in Italian cooking. Or many people don't know that the lemon, which is so, uh, such a symbol of Naples, you know, especially the Amalfi Coast. Well, the lemon wasn't there when the Greeks came. The lemon was brought mainly by the Persian people who had been enslaved during the Roman Empire. And people used to call the lemon the Persian apple. So 
you learn so much about history and about your own heritage and where you come from through the food you cook in southern Italy. Though I keep saying that, but it's truly, if you really look for it, it's in every culture. So to me, it's, it's um, yes, my book is focused on southern Italy and in particular, uh, Bacoli, a small coastal town, which is where I was raised. Um, and we talk about, you know, Alessandro faces homelessness, he, fa he, he faces wars, he faces a civil war between southern Italy and northern Italy. Um, he, he faces um, hardships that he had no idea of. But in every chapter, every time we change era, uh, there's always food. There's always a reason why that food was brought or that food was made or how that food was cooked. He learns also that the best wheat during the Roman Empire, the best wheat had to go to the, to, to the capital, to Rome. So people who would actually harvest the wheat, they couldn't keep the good stuff. They, they could only keep the, 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 very, the most humble type of wheat, which didn't really taste good. But if you didn't bring it to Rome, then the emperor would enslave you and your family. So you had to do that. And, and that, that was also something I wanted to do in my book was don't focus on the colonizer. No, show me what happened. Don't talk to me about the emperors. We all know about Nero and uh, Caesar and, and, and everybody else. History has covered that, that plenty. I want to know how the ancestors lived. I want to know how the humble people lived, the farmers, the, the fishermen, how did they live? How were they affected? So show me the colonized, show me what that did to them. I love it. Well, I feel like I have learned so much just in our short conversation. And so I'm really looking forward to when this book comes out because it sounds amazing. Just like your other books, if you have anybody watching, if you haven't checked out her books yet, I really recommend it. That's the Stroke of Magic series. Book two is going to be coming out soon. And she has another middle grade novel that's going to be coming out. So keep an eye out for those. Bruna, thank you so much for joining us. It was such a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll have this up on Instagram in just a few minutes and then later on YouTube. Bye. Bye-bye.